Well, Lord, we just thank you that we have this moment to connect, uh, to share your story. And ultimately, God, we just ask that you would be glorified and that Dan's story would help a ton of people. We know, God, that you have done a great work in him and you are doing a great work through him. And we believe that you will continue to do that. Thank you for your faithfulness in his life. Thank you for your redemption in his life. Thank you for your restoration. And we just ask that you would be all over this story in Jesus' name. Amen. So we started this, you know, story podcast, incredible couple episodes already. And uh, it's so funny because I told you this, um, that uh, I reached out to you to see if you'd be open to having this conversation, sharing a little bit of your story. Mm-hmm. And when the second episode came out, somebody texted me saying, have you thought of Dan Hazuka? And so here we are, you know, um, man, just so grateful to be the inter- introduce you to, to our audience. I know that it's interesting that uh, there's, a, there's a separation in age, but there's a, there's a koinonia in the spirit. Amen. I think God, you know, brought you into my life. And I look back on my decade here in Omaha, Nebraska, and I think of the many moments where we've sat across one another at Hoo Hot or Longhorn Steakhouse and encourage one another. And I'm so thankful for your mentorship in my life. I feel the same way, brother. I loved you ever since I met you, you know, and so it's been a great ride. Yeah, it's been amazing. And yeah. I'm excited to just dive into your life a little bit. And, you know, I'd love for you to take us back to your childhood. You know, yeah. I know that the childhood for you was extremely difficult. And so can you share a little bit about how your life began? Okay. I uh, grew up in South Omaha. Um, we moved, I think it was three times before I moved out to my grandmother's for about a year and a half. And then we came back. Uh, I lived on 20th and O Street down in South Omaha in a little two two room. There was actually, there was three rooms on the first, on the, in this house, uh, there was somebody living in the front room, and then there was, we lived in the other two small rooms, and then there was a family that lived down in the basement. Our backyard was literally the South Omaha, well, actually Omaha dump. Wow. Uh, and uh, grew up in an alcoholic home, and uh, just uh, a lot of just, chaos, I guess you could say, uh, going on in the home with my mom and, and uh, father. I had, uh, I actually got uh, three bro- I have three sisters and two brothers. Uh, three of those passed away now. Mm. And uh, I have two younger sisters alive. And uh, went to school at St. Agnes uh, grade school. Then I went to South High for two and a half years. I quit in my junior year. And uh, used to go to the pool hall all the time down in South Omaha and play pool. I really uh, enjoyed it. You were good, it, too. Well, I got Come to be now. good. I got to be good after a while, yeah. I mean, that's a whole other story. It we'll, is. We'll get, we'll into, get that. into that. <laughs> Low-key hustle. So, so, so um, the, yeah, then then uh, when I quit school, I, my mom was so busy with just all the other kids and, and just the environment we lived in and the chaos that was going on that... Uh, she didn't really have the time to teach us a lot, you know. <laughs> she was a loving, great mother, but uh, there was too many other things going on, so I didn't have that. When I got into high school, I started running around with some of the wrong kids. Had similar situations on South Omaha. And, Which this brings, uh, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. I think this brings a great, a great point up, that if we... If, if, we, if there's not intentional investment, mentorship, discipleship in the home, mm-hmm. right, we have the propensity or the temptation to start running with the wrong crew. Yes. And this was true in your life. No and so question. you're starting to go down no that question. path. So here you are in high school and you start getting surrounded by the wrong people. Right. Tell, maybe help our listeners understand the trajectory that that path started to take you down. 
Well, uh, and and that's when I went through grade school, I wasn't I was doing fine. As soon as I started going to high school, then I started running with some of the wrong kids, and uh, and so we would do little things, nothing serious, but little things wrong, you know. And uh, and I didn't want to go home in the evening uh, because there was always chaos going on. My dad was a very angry person, and uh, there was violence going on at times in the home with with. My mother, I mean, and and the the rest of us. Uh, so I so I literally would stay outside uh, and watch. And when my father got home from work, he usually went to the bar afterwards, and then he sat at the kitchen table and he would drink there uh, all evening, and then he'd go to bed. I literally would stay outside watching him uh, until he went to bed before I would go in the house. He always thought I was out running around. I was literally outside, but I, I didn't want to be in, in the chaos. And uh, so I would I'd do that. And then, and then, you know, I'd do little things, you know, but I end up going to the pool hall a lot. And then after I quit high school, uh, and was walking the streets during the day, uh, the, with a, cu a couple other guys and, the uh, Police actually picked us up for vagrancy. They could do that back then. And they took us before a judge, and the judge says, young men, uh, either you go to the Boise Reform School or uh, you join the military. And so I went down and I joined the military, joined the Army at 17. And uh, a friend of mine that went with me, we went to Fort Omaha, and we went through the... Uh, tests and that to get in, and he failed the test, so he couldn't get in. Wow. So I was shipped off to Fort uh, Riley, Kansas for my basic training. While I'm in Fort Riley, Kansas, he and a couple of other guys uh, went out and they robbed a, a uh, pharmacy down on 21st and Q Street, and he got three years in the joint. Wow. I, so you I, see the trajectory here. You get... You know, you're you go to the army or the military right. three years there, and right. he ends up not getting in right. and gets three years in the joint. Yeah, yeah. And so then, and then I, in military, I, I went from there from uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. I went to Fort Dix, New Jersey, for some school training, and then they shipped me over on a uh, troop carrier over to France. A couple of weeks over there, I went to London and things like that, and then. Got, got to spend almost 31 months in France, so, I mean, got to see a lot of things. But I grew up so um, dysfunctional mm. that I didn't know personally how to really live. I mean, I was emotionally, physically, uh, sexually, and, and mentally, you know, just a wreck in so many ways. I didn't know how to live, and so... Over there, I mean, you know, what I did is I, we do whatever they told us to do during the week, you know, but on the weekends, then we'd go down and we'd party at the bars or whatever, you know. And so you get back, you get back, and then this is where we get into some of your young adult life. And right. what's interesting is, you know, we've had a number of conversations, and we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more, um, but you grow up with this really difficult childhood. All right despising your father yep and in your mind you're thinking that's not who i want to become exactly then you get back and you start living your young adult life <laughs> let our listeners know where life ended up taking you once you get back well i get back and and uh i really didn't know what i was going to do i did get my ged in the in the army i could go to uno uh, i had a full ride because i spent three years in the army and so I actually started out to UNO, uh, and I would I was working at the packing house. I was lugging beef, and and uh, which was which was a lot of fun, a lot of work. And uh, then I started bartending for my uncle. I had three uncles that owned taverns here in Omaha, and uh, one of them was across the street from the projects down in South Omaha. So I started bartending down there in the evenings, and. Uh, then a pool hall. I played a lot of pool and uh, during the Army as well. And uh, there was a pool hall that came up for sale down in Bellevue, Nebraska. And the guy I was working at the packing house with, him and I both decided that, you know, 
why don't we look into that and maybe buying that? So my uncle encouraged me to go into business. I had no clue what I was going to do because I don't really have an education. I was just a laborer, you know, doing whatever. But I was a hard worker. And uh, so we ended up we ended up going and talking to this guy that owned the bowling alley as well as this pool hall down in Bellevue, and we ended up buying the pool hall. My, my uncle encouraged me. I have to say, if it wasn't for him, I probably would have never done something like that. Interesting. You know, he said he thought I could do it, you know. And I was only 22 years old. I got wow. out when I was almost 21, and here I go into business. I actually, when I started at UNO, I was going to, I was taking business classes, you know. So from business well, I, classes to actually I know, you know, running a business at 22 years old, I know. you know, getting the lending that you need from a bank. I mean, crazy. Actually, actually on that there, the guy that, that, that owned the bar, he took the note for, from us. We had to pay him, so I didn't have to get a note Interesting. There, so which really helped there. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, but uh, so, we, so him and I, you know, I continue, we both continue to work at our jobs. And we had, there was a gal, an older gal that run the pool hall. It was a real nice pool hall down in South, I mean, down in Bellevue. The one in South Omaha, when I grew up, and what we were in, and it was all, you know, cigars and cigarettes and a smoky place. And I mean, it was the pits, you know, but this place, they had all carpeted and it was all just really, really a nice place. And uh, uh, so we, we would, both take turns. I would work one night, he'd work the next night. We had a gal that worked all during the day, and then on the weekend we'd take turns. And so we worked that. And so after a, about a year and a half or so, we saved up some money from that. And then uh, my next jump was, we, there was a bar that was for sale in South Omaha on 10th and Dorcas Street. And uh, so we decided we're gonna go in the bar business too. So. We keep the pool hall business, we keep our job, then we bought the bar, and then we start running a bar along with it. And uh, this is when things get interesting. They get very interesting because the first day that I'm in the bar business, my partner's dad and the biggest bookmaker in Omaha, Nebraska, came in and gave us football sheets. Uh, to start taking bets on football, it was really big. And I mean, well, you mm -hmm. got the University of Nebraska, and I'm obviously, I mean, everybody, a lot of people bet, especially in bars and that. For know? sure. I mean, they're yep. they're always betting and that, and so they taught us how to take bets, and then we would call in and give them the bets, and then we'd get a, a portion of that money. Well, after a period of time, we saw this money that were given to the big bookmaker, and we thought. Wait a second Let, here. Let's do it ourselves. <laughs> yeah. So we start doing, literally start bookmaking ourselves. And uh, then, then uh, we decided we both were going to get married. This is in 1965. So he yeah. got married and I got married. So now we, each, we had two different businesses. So we decided that one would take one business and one would take the other. So he took the pool hall and I took the bar. Probably the first mistake in my life wow. because I drink. You know, I grew yeah. up in an alcoholic home, and it, and also my dad gambled everything away. Now, what am I doing? I bought a bar, and I also in bookmaking gambling. Wow! I mean, both the exact same thing is what my father was doing. So that's the and that's the connection I wanted to make. Is you despised your father and the life that you lived growing up? Really, the only difference between your life and the life you experienced with your father is instead of losing all your money gambling, you were making a lot of money. That's exactly right. But it was alcohol and gambling. Hey, alcohol and, and you gambling. And you were heading down that same path. And I had no idea because I hated him for what he, he had done. And here I'm doing the same thing and no clue at all. And so anyway... Now, can we stop right here? Because I think this yeah. is this is interesting. Okay. This is really powerful. Okay. So just tell us, connect today. Like we're filming this today. Okay. And I need you to stop for just a second and connect this moment and, and your story with your father to what this day represents. Like the day that we're filming this. Wow. Well, when you asked me to do this here a short time ago, uh, I didn't think nothing of it. And then a couple of weeks ago, when I looked at my schedule on this day, 
It's the day that my father passed away 43 years ago. Come on. Today. Today. And I thought, that is very interesting. And that's a whole nother story yeah. that we'll get into. We'll get into okay. later, yep. But it is, yeah. And uh, so, so we both split. It, he took one, I took the other business. In the meantime, then, I had, I, I put a guy into bookmaking. I made a lot of money on bookmaking. In today's money, a couple hundred thousand dollars in four month period, somewhere in that area. And so I had money, you know, and it's all in cash. And so uh, I started a guy to open a used car lot up on 42nd Street, right off the interstate across the street from the McDonald's there. And so, uh, uh, that's another business I had. And now I'm in the bar business, I'm in the bookmaking business, I'm in the used car business as well. Mm -hmm. And growing up so poor as I did, I was driven by money. Mm. I mean, because I wanted things. And so I started getting those things through the businesses that I had. And uh, I mean, I really, I look back and it was really the love of money. I was chasing money. Wow. You know, I, I grew up in the church, okay? Uh, and I went to church every Sunday, but I really didn't know Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You didn't have Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's make you a hamburger is what I always wow. tell people. Wow, 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 wow. And so, so I was empty mm -hmm. on the inside. I was lost in so many ways, and but so, I was driven. And so you're driven, you're lost, but now you're married. Okay, so uh -huh. you get married in 65, and, and maybe you can walk us through, you know, the early parts of your marriage all the way up to 79. Okay. I got a, actually got uh, went into business at 65. Actually, we got married when I was uh, in uh, 68. Okay, 68. Okay, yeah. 68. Great. So then we then I had three children. Uh, I have two daughters and a son. And a bar is you're working seven days a week. Mm. So I was working all the time. Once we had the children, then I wasn't around home is like I should be. Uh, and that created mm. problems right there, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And after, after uh, each one of the children, my wife and I, we would have some, I had all my faults. Well, she had some faults as well. Yep. And so we didn't we didn't get along very well at times mm -hmm. and uh in 1979 she filed for divorce on me because i wasn't around a lot and i was running just like when i was a kid mm. i uh i didn't want to go home because of all the things that was going on so I ran away from pain wow and so I ran away from pain wow I didn't want to go home because of always the arguments and things because so I was doing the same thing that I didn't like you know? Wow. It, it may it reminds me of the statement hurt people hurt people no right question. and you're in your the pain that you were experiencing in that reality was really a trigger for the trauma and the pain from your past. It really it's was. It's interesting how those things collide and yeah. it, it just more so sort of stirs up the freedom and the forgiveness and the redemption that you needed to experience. So your wife ends up filing for divorce. And so what do you do? Because this is when life starts to shift for you. Well, that really was the, that was really the best thing that ever happened to me. Other than going into the army, going into the army was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, up, up to that point, because it got me away from all of the guys and the friends that I had growing up. Hmm. And so, and, and I matured in a lot of ways, and I got a lot of discipline in the Army, which I didn't have at home. Mm -hmm. um, and 
where was that? Yeah, so so I was we were just talking about how um, so you end up going to have a conversation with your sister. Like you, your wife ends up filing divorce. Yeah, after and, she filed after she filed for divorce. It really affected me. My sister had come to Christ uh, four or five years previous to that. And when I was around her, I mean, she was just so sweet and so nice. But because I'm in sin doing my own thing, I really didn't want to be around her. But when I was really hurting, I uh, decided to go over and talk to her. And so I went over to her house and I talked to her. And uh, she told me what I needed was Jesus Christ. Now, I had went to church all these years, you know, and uh, so I prayed a simple, she, she invited me to pray a simple little prayer and invite Jesus Christ into my life. And I did that at her kitchen table and I walked out of there and I knew that I was a changed man uh, I, I, I could, I went out and it was like the light was on. Wow. You know, and from that day forward, I, alcohol was one of the first things that God took away from me. I hadn't, I never drank after that day. I drank one time in the last 44 years. And that was when I was up in Canada with my, or Alaska with my son, probably 15 years ago. I had one drink at a, a place that we're, we stayed at but that's the only drink I've had. It's not that I can't have one, I just don't choose to have one because I've seen all the, all the uh, pain that it caused not only while I was growing up and then me, myself, as I was growing, you know, with the family and that, drinking too much. So you're starting so, to experience, man, some life change and you come to Christ in 79 and then um, we fast forward to, there's a moment, I believe, uh, there early in the 80s where you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit that really propelled you in some areas. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah, you know what, I wanna back up a little bit because after after having the bar business and then uh, I sold that in 73. Mm. And um, at the pool hall in the bar, there's a, there's a guy that sold sandwiches to us. It was called Stewart Sandwiches. Yeah. And so, when I was getting ready to sell the bar because of all the time I was investing in that, him and I got to talk about the sandwich business. And so we thought, why can't we do this? You know? Yeah. So when I sold the bar, I got a $50,000 SBA loan and started a sandwich business in 1974 making prepackaged sandwiches and other snack items and selling them to all the different stores and uh, employee lunchrooms and whatever here in Omaha. And then we spread out and we start going, I ended up going about 150 mile radius of Omaha. We had all these trucks driving around refrigerator trucks and putting sandwiches in all your convenience stores, bars, employee lunchrooms, golf courses and that. So. So we got that uh, going. Then, then when I come to Christ, mm. uh, I'm unequally yoked. I didn't know anything about that in the Bible with, mm -hmm. with my partner. And God kept convicting me because we, were doing, we weren't doing everything correctly. Mm. Okay, in fact, my uncle actually told me just take 10% right off the top, you know, when you, of, the, of the money, you know. So I was doing some things that were wrong. God convicted me and I couldn't do that anymore. Wow. You know, but my partner, he didn't know the Lord. And, mm -hmm. and I tried witnessing to him for a couple of, uh, probably maybe a year, year and a half, somewhere in that area. And uh, he didn't want to know anything about it. And so uh, in our business, it, it was right around the early eighties Okay, and you think you got inflation bad today? Well, it was a lot worse back then. It was 20% interest on money wow. at, at the bank. And so our business starts sliding down. Mm -hmm. And when 
when uh, uh, that happened, one day he walked into me and says that he was going to start another business. He was leaving me. Wow. Now, our business isn't doing very good. We got a, a loan out. It was in my name. He didn't have the loan in his name. So in today's money, it was probably five, six hundred thousand dollars Wow. Know? And he was going to walk out on me. Uh, and I panicked, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm walking with the Lord. And the Lord uh, told me to give this guy a check for thousands of dollars. And he was walking out before this, uh, before the business went wow. belly up. Wow. And he, so I gave him this check and I had him sign the business over. And the next thing uh, is, is as I'm going to church and learning about the principles of God, mm -hmm. the scripture that he gave me at that time was, will a man rob God, yet you're robbing me. How are we robbing me in tithes and offerings? You're cursed with the curse, bring the whole tithe in the storehouse and test me now in this and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing till there is no more need. And so at that time, I, uh, it said, test me. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously I'm in the gambling business, you know? So and so like, I says, okay, okay. God, uh, I'm gonna test you. And so I went uh, and I started giving the church large amounts of money. And God showed up in a tremendous way. Uh, and it wasn't, I wasn't giving to get, I was just obeying what God said to do. For sure. And, and uh, I look back and I mean, it was like three years and all, all, all new trucks, all new marketing material and uh, nothing changed. I didn't get any smarter. None of my people got any smarter. It's just only the, the one thing is, is that I start giving to God's work. In your obedience, you invited the blessing of God onto your business and your life. No and so question. at this at this time, though, were you still bookmaking? I but yes, when I I came to Christ in 1979, and and God took alcohol was the first thing, foul mouth, cigarettes. I had a stronghold in finances yes. and the love of money. Yes, and then. I lost a hundred thousand dollars on one weekend. Wow! Hello. And I knew before that God was prompting me. Yeah, I, mean, I, knew, to stir in your heart. I knew. We know when God is prompting us to quit doing something, and I kept doing it. I mean, it was a stronghold in my life. We mm -hmm. And so, but that day, that weekend, that was it. I quit. I never have gambled since, or took any bets or anything. It was the best, one of the best things that ever happened to me. I mean, it's just amazing what God has done. I mean, it's, yeah, it really is amazing what he's done in your life. And I think this would be a good time to connect the story of, you know, because your friend, right, that ended up not getting into the military, you know, spends three years in the joint, gets out, and then they end yeah. up getting in some, some major trouble, right, in Colorado? Yeah, yeah. And then after, so when he gets out, you know, in... in I get out of the army pretty close. And so, you know, I'd go to parties once in a while on the weekend, but I was working two jobs or whatever. I was working all the time because I was driven to, to have something. And uh, he kept running with a lot of guys that, you know, I grew up with that getting in trouble yet, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, he went out to Colorado with a couple of these guys. They end up robbing a, uh, a store out there, but this time they kill a guy. Wow. And he gets life in prison out in Colorado. And uh, I, I just look back, but for the grace of God, Come on, there's man. no other, there's, there's no, no other, other, no other reason why, because I mean, I, that should be, it could have been me. I don't know why he just couldn't get in the army and I did. I, you know what I mean? And then I quit running with those guys and 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 he he gets that so he gets life in prison now i'm running a bar my uncle's got a bar and his brother worked at that my uncle's bar and one day my uncle called me up and says that his alex was his name 
is despondent and he's at this other bar uh, down in South Omaha, would you go down and check on him? And so I said, sure. So I went down and check on his brother and I, I drove up to the place and I parked and I was walking the back door and there he is, he's he dead, he, he, shot, he killed himself. And so I go out to Colorado, I, I get on a plane and I go out to Colorado, that's during the winter time, and I drive from Denver, Colorado, down to Canyon City where my friend is, you know. I told his family I would go, and uh, I go down to see him, you know, tell him his brother passed away, and you know. It, it just, I, I mean, the two, di the two different people, you know. And, and two, and, and and two no, different lives. Yeah, and, and no reason. But in that moment, when you go to see him and share that horrific news, is that when you share the gospel with him? No, no. Uh, I, uh, at that time, I'm trying to think. No, it, it wasn't. I'm trying to think if I even knew the Lord then. So later on, though, can you, yeah. can you, can you catch us up? Because I think one thing that I'm trying to extract here is that at a young age, for by the grace of God, yeah. you go on these completely different trajectories right. in life right. that take you in, you know, comp just down completely different paths. Yet eventually this guy comes to Christ. Yeah, well, here, here's what happened. So when I have the bar, uh, he's out in Canyon City, Colorado. Yeah, I didn't know the Lord when I went out and see him. When his brother passed. Yeah, when his brother passed. And... Uh, Actually, he even broke out of prison. Wow. And him and another guy came into my bar. And at the time, I, I had a lot of crazy people that I knew to come into the bar at that time. I grew up with a lot of guys that loved to box mm -hmm. in the glo golden gloves, and they, a lot of them even ended up being Hell's Angels. Mm. And so at that time, uh, I had a bunch of them come into the bar. They were in the bar at that time when my friend came in from after he broke out of prison. He was with another guy. And they were both loaded. I mean, they both had a couple of guns in them, on them. I thought I was going to have the shootout at the OK Corral. It was wow. just, it was, it was amazing. But, but um, that didn't happen. So he he ended up flying out to uh, to he, he broke out. He going out to California and robbing a jewelry store out there, and before he gets picked up and gets thrown back in prison. But he gets out of prison probably 15 years or whatever it was later, maybe 20 years after that, you know. And by this time you had come to Christ and you're on yeah, fire. Yeah, yeah, and and he walks into my uh, office after he got out of prison and me and my sister, my sister was my secretary and uh, she prayed, we prayed with him to receive Jesus Christ and uh, he started going to church, Glad Tidings Assembly of God, and I mean, his life was transformed. And then he actually had surgery a few years later, but he was doing really good. He was doing, uh, he had surgery a few years later, and on, on a note before he went into sur surgery, he says, all the shootings and all the killings are all in my past, my friends. I now am following Jesus Christ. I mean, it was just a phenomenal, uh, thing that he wrote on a napkin before he went into surgery, not knowing what was going to happen. And he ended up dying on that, uh, uh, in surgery. Uh, I went to his funeral and, uh, just, and in fact, I took my son to it at, at the same time. So. so crazy. Like that, that story is just so profound and powerful. And obviously you guys live very different lives and he, he died much younger than you, but praise God that he experienced the grace of God. Yeah. And when you showed me that, yes. what he wrote, yeah. you know, as basically like his last words to the world, so right. powerful, right. just exalting Jesus. But I wanna, I wanna sort of pivot here and come back to, you know, so you're following Christ, God is moving powerfully. He challenges you with the tithe. He begins blessing your business, but your marriage is still on the rocks and I want you to talk a little bit about the challenge that he, he gave you once you moved out for a season. Like, what was that challenge that he gave you? Okay, so, 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 so what happened after she filed for divorce on me, I came to Christ. I'm starting to rapidly change. Somebody invited me to a Bible study. Somebody invited me to another church. I was raised in one denomination. Somebody invited me to another church. I started going to that other church and to my church, I would mm -hmm. do both of them for almost a year. 
uh, and and out of that, um, when I'm reading the Word of God all the time, it, it is is that uh, God put it on my heart after I bought my partner out in the sandwich business. God put it on my heart because of what the Word of God was doing in my life. Uh, there's a scripture that he gave me, it was Matthew 4, 4, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. And he had me put that on all my labels of all my sandwiches, on the sides of my truck, Come on, man. on my letterhead, because of the transformation that God was doing in my life. And there's a scripture that says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God unto salvation. Mm -hmm. So I was not ashamed to do that. And it mm -hmm. kept me on track then too, because now I'm being bold to putting it out there. And so now I actually have to walk it out. And uh, so it was good for me all the way around. And what was the other? What, yeah, so, so, what I, so I wanted you to kind of encapsulate um, the challenge to go back home. Okay. Because I think that that is going to, Okay. It's we're gonna hit that, and then we're gonna just just talk about you know at a high level after that the fruit that you've experienced as a result of the obedience of that decision. Okay. Well, after being out of the house a year and a half, she did not go through with the divorce. It was there, but she didn't go through with it. As I'm reading the Word of God, the Holy Spirit prompted me. He says, "If you want your family saved." I want you to go back home. Wow. And uh, I didn't really want to go back home because of the way I was treated. And obviously some of that was my own fault. For sure, okay? absolutely. Right, so Come let's on get now. that on the table, absolutely. you know what I mean? Absolutely. But I knew what I was going back to. And I, and I remember distinctly, I cried like a baby. Wow. I, I really didn't want to go back home, but I knew God spoke to me to go back home. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going back home, and she allowed me to come back into the house. And, and really, for the next 15 years, it was about 15 years, I was back in the house. But she filed another four, I mean, three more times, then the fourth time she, she divorced me in 1995. And she was probably, you know, I look back, and I'm not blaming her for anything, because I was blind. Mm -hmm. And all the things I was doing, and Under I believe I believe that she was doing a lot of the same things that she was raised in, you know, treating her husband, you know, the way she did, and so and and it hurt me. So I would, you know, I didn't want to be around it, you know. Yeah. So and, true. And and I and I think that's, I yeah. really do believe that's what happened. So it's got yeah. nothing nothing bad to say. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the reality is, is when we step into marriage, we're bringing all of our past experience with us right you know the perspectives that we were raised with the, right. the belief systems all yeah. of that yeah. and the next thing you know you got two sinners under one roof trying to figure out how to do life together and it's difficult yeah right marriage yeah. isn't easy it's extremely difficult and so the beauty though that i wanted to extract from that moment is your obedience and now we 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 you know that was so so you go back home do you remember when what year that was yeah, it was probably 1980, it, it was 81, 80, 81. So 80, yeah. 81, and yeah. now here we are, it's 2023, man. So you've <laughs> lived a lot of life. I mean, we could probably sit here for the next three hours and unpack all that God has done. Yeah. But I want you to sort of touch on just the fruit of that, of the obedience of going back home, how you've seen God move in your family. I mean, we're talking about, it's not just your children, but it's your children's children that are walking in the blessing of God. Yeah. And man, I'm just, I tell you this all the time. I think, and uh, I think today as we film this story, um, they've gotten the composed version of Dan Hazuka, but I sit in a lot of groups with you where man, you are so passionate for the word of God, for um, you know helping men of God continue to grow and you're a guy that lives it, man. And I love it because you're sprinting towards the finish line. You haven't mailed in uh, a card to like say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm chilling, I'm, cruise, I'm on cruise control. 
is something that I that I love about your life. Can you talk about just man how you've seen God move over the last handful of years? Oh, I I mean I it, it is just absolutely unbelievable. I mean I I'll get, I'll just start with uh, you know putting Matthew four four on there then yeah then in, I took my family on a vacation to um, Colorado and and uh, come back and and I was going to uh, a, another church and and they had a mission trip going to. Uh, um, Quito, Ecuador, and God told me to go to Quito, Ecuador. I remember going to Quito, Ecuador. It's down in the mountains, I mean, in a valley. And uh, I helped build a church there. And uh, uh, I mean, and I just left Colorado. So I so I, I go on that mission trip. They asked, we all sat around and talked, and they, everybody asked, what, why did you come? And, uh, and I says, God told me to come. I said, I have no idea why I'm here other than that. So I just obeyed God. So then the next year I took my family to uh, New York City. We went to Times Square and, you know, seen Stat Statue of Liberty, you know, all the things around there. And I come back from there uh, uh, and I get a, l a letter from David Wilkerson. I never knew who he was, but my sister had his newsletter sent to me. He's the one that started Teen Challenge of them. Uh, wow. Yeah nationally and he also wrote, wrote the book the cross and the switchblade but anyway in this newsletter it says that he was going to start a church in times square and 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 god spoke to me that i'm to go back and help him build that i mean start that church so the following year i'm going back to new york city i signed up for it and and uh, and i i'll never forget i was in times square uh, hotel and I was on the seventh floor in, in this old dingy room, and I was saying, Lord, what am I doing here? And I had just went through uh, a discipleship thing to learn how to share my t uh, testimony, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. and share Christ with people, evangelism explosion. And so, so while we're there, you know, I said, Lord, what am I doing here? And he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Mm. You're here to do that. So what, what I did that whole 10 days is we go out and we would pass out pamphlets about the church services and we'd pray with people, invited them to the church or, you know, see if they would uh, accept Christ. So I did that, you know, but I mean, just things like that, that just continued yeah. to happen. Just obedience. I think, yeah, your market, your life has been marked by steps of obedience even in the midst of maybe your family not responding, but God gave a promise to you. And I think one of the things that I love about you is you pray for your family faithfully every single day. Before we close, I, I do want to, um, I want you to share a little bit about just, man, what has been the secret sauce for your life? We'll get to that here in a second. But I do want to, I want to talk about, because you've, you've been at Love Church for about 12 years now, and God's moved powerfully in your family's life. Mm -hmm. you know, here at this mm -hmm. ministry. Talk about how you got here and how you ended up, you know, walking through these doors. Well, uh, and I, uh, yes, I do always pray for my family every day. I, I pray Acts sixteen thirty one. believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy household. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I pray scripture and, and uh, pray for the family. And then one day my son was saying that he was gonna come to move, go to another church, Calvary down at Millard South and I, you know, I was always praying for him to go get into an evangelical type church. And so I decided to go with him and his mm -hmm. wife and my grandkids to Millard, uh, Millard North. North. Yeah, Millard North. And uh, one thing led to another. I mean, uh, I was asking God after about a year, I said, Lord, what am I doing here? He said, you're here to sow into these young people's lives. You know? Wow. And so, and I had gone to another church for yeah. 28 and a half years before exactly. I came there. Exactly. And then the next thing I know, and it, it wasn't too much longer after that, that my daughter started coming. And then my son-in-law came and they're both walking with the Lord. Come on, you man. Know? And uh, I just see God working and has worked little by little in my family, drawing them. He, he gave me that promise. And all three of my children now are walking with the Lord. Come on, man. And uh, it, come on, I mean, just, look at your life. He takes, he takes a broken young man from South Omaha who made some poor decisions and just look at the redemption. And like I said, 
here you are still to this day pouring out. But I, I would love for you to share with our listeners what has been the secret sauce for you, because I think that this is really crucial. Um, can you talk a little bit about for you, just the way that you live your life two hours before your first meeting every day to just share with our listeners, man, how they can finish the race strong. Well, God gave me uh, Proverbs eight seventeen. It, those who seek me early and diligently will find me. Mm. And uh, so I seek God early and diligently. I uh, read the word every single morning. That's the, the first thing I do is I get up and I worship the Lord. And then I read the word of God and then I pray. Mm. And so I do that daily. Uh, and there's no mistake of the fruit that, that, that comes, you know, Jesus tells us to abide in him and then we'll produce fruit. Well, you know, our heart of this church, man, is to see people become self feeders. Your life is the fruit of the vision that we desire for every single person that walks in here. Yeah, no question. And you are living it, man. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I mean, the first 30 years, uh, I read through the Bible every year through the whole Bible, along with all kinds of other readings. Um, so, I mean, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Word of God is transformative. Mm -hmm. It will change your life. And uh, there's this, another scripture, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by Come the renewing of your mind. And when I got saved, I mean, you got all these things in your mind that are not godly and not right, you know. But as I read the Word of God, little by little, all that went away, and now the Word of God comes to my mind, and good things come to my mind all the time instead of all the other stuff. So, Well, you're an inspiration. God's used you in a mighty way in my life. You continue to speak destiny, purpose, and I'm so thankful. I know many people are thankful for your faithfulness, your courage, um, and I'd love for you to just, you know, take a second to just pray um, to conclude our time. Okay. Yeah, it'd be awesome. All right. Father God, we just uh, come to you. We thank you for this day. I thank you for my brother O.C. Thank you for what uh, Love Church has done for mm -hmm. Pastor Todd and mm -hmm. Denise and yeah. their faithfulness, uh, Lord, and all the leadership. Lord, we just pray a edge of protection around them. We pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to use this. A church to glorify yourself yeah. and to bring many people to come to know you in a real and a personal way, Lord. Lord, we know that uh, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by your Holy yeah. Spirit movement. So That's I it. just pray that uh, That's it. you would touch people's lives and that you would be glorified in all we do and say, and we'll give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you, man. <laughs>